name is Henry Lebedinsky, and I'm the co-artistic director of Pacific Music Works. And I'd like to welcome you to the very first of our virtual underground performances, trying to bring you a little piece of the underground concert experience in this odd intermission time that we're all living through together. So grab a tasty beverage and let's explore the world of Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, La Mula Mexicana. Juana Inés de Aspaje y Ramírez de Santillana was born in San Miguel de Pantla, the illegitimate daughter of a Spanish officer and his mixed-race wife, a criolla woman. She was raised on her maternal grandfather's hacienda, and when she was a small child she would sneak away unnoticed into the chapel's library, where she would read book after book. She was self-taught, an extremely gifted person, and by the age of three, she could read and write in Latin. By the age of eight, she was writing her own poetry. And by 13, she was teaching younger children how to read and write in Latin. She also taught herself her mother's native language, Nahual, uh, the language of the Nahua people and also spoken uh, by a lot of indigenous people in that region of Mexico. She wrote poetry in that language as well. So even from a young age, we're dealing with a woman of incredible prodigious talent. And the circumstances in which she was living was a Mexico that was extremely rich through mineral resources, uh, precious metals, and trade. A multicultural civilization where people from Spain, people who, uh, coming from different parts of Europe, tradesmen, uh, craftsmen, miners, and Native Americans were living together in... Uh, a quite an unjust system of colonialism, and this is something that would haunt Sor Juana through her entire life. I'd like to turn to a little music now, a lullaby in Nahual, written by Gaspar Fernandes. He was a Portuguese-born composer who spent most of his life in the New World, first in Guadamara, and then the last 23 years of his life as Maestro de Capilla at the Cathedral in Puebla, Mexico. He died in 1629, and his music bridges the styles between Renaissance and early Baroque, sensitively treating the rhythms of the Nahual language uh, in the music. And he wrote in Latin, Spanish, Portuguese, and Nahual, and uh, every language that he said, he really tried to bring out the rhythmic elements of that language in unique and sensitive ways. Laura Pudwell joins singers Catherine Webster, Danielle Sampson, and Ross Hauck with Stephen Stubbs and the Pacific Music Works Ensemble. This is the lullaby Sikochi Sikochi from our 2016 Navidad concert at Mini Hall in Seattle. Enjoy. Shikochi, 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 shikochi.
Nahual was one of the many languages spoken by Sor Juana de la Cruz. Uh, she learned at a young age. And when she was 16, she was sent to live in Mexico City. And according to a letter that she wrote, uh, she tried to gain access to the university there by dressing up as a boy. It didn't work. And she did catch the attention of the court in Mexico City and became a lady-in-waiting to the viceroy's wife, the viceroy of Mexico, uh, who was born in Italy and quite a patron of the arts herself. Uh, the viceroy tutored her in languages and mathematics, and when she was there, she became quite the sensation at court. She attracted visitors of a great intellectual standing. And in 1669, Juana entered the Hieronymite convent of Santa Paula so she could devote herself to writing and study. That's something that she would not have been able to do as a young woman of, uh, in, in the secular world. Behind convent walls, just as in Europe, uh, women could have access to education that patriarchy and church prohibited them from doing uh, at home. And very quickly, she amassed a very large library as well as some very influential patrons, the Viceroy and Vice Reign being a head among them, who financed the publication of her poetry and plays both in the New World and the Old. Her comedies were particularly noteworthy because in them she was free to ridicule the notions of male superiority promulgated in literature and on the stage. Uh, very quickly she became known on both sides of the Atlantic as the Tenth Muse, and the Phoenix of Mexico. Let's have some more music. Here's a setting of Sor Juana's Viancico, a Christmas carol, called Queritito Airecios. It was set by Bolivian composer Antonio Duran de la Mota, who is the maestro de capilla at the cathedral in the imperial city of Potosí. Now, we don't have very much of Sor Juana's music that survives. We know that she did compose. But her poetry was so well known on both sides of the Atlantic that many composers in New Spain and Old set her poetry. This is one of three texts by Sor Juana that we know Durán de la Mota set. And in her, as in many of her poems, she's unafraid to examine assumed gender roles and lay bare the issues at heart. In this Viancico, Saint Joseph just learned that his wife Mary is pregnant. Instead of dealing with the issue head-on, he chooses to close his eyes and go to sleep. It takes an angel of God to set him straight and deal with his pride, his shame, and his jealousy. Here are sopranos Tess Altaveros and Danielle Sampson with Stephen Stubbs and Pacific Music Works from our 2019 Navidad concert at Nordstrom Recital Hall at Benaroya Hall in Seattle. Enjoy.
Sor Juana de la Cruz. Unafraid to tackle the issues of gender, masculinity, head on. Now in 1690, Manuel Fernandez de Santa Cruz, the Bishop of Puebla, Mexico, published one of Sor Juana's theological works. This was a critique of a sermon written about 40 years ago by a Portuguese Jesuit. Uh, he published this under the pseudonym Sor Filotea de la Cruz. With it, he included a letter saying that women, especially nuns, should better stick to their prayers and not waste their time writing or publishing. That's not a fit career for a nice little nun. Now, Sor Juana would have none of this. She penned a response asserting women's rights to education and also couched that with the practical benefit of women teaching other women, avoiding potentially dangerous situations of male teachers abusing young female students. She also turned her caustic wit on those who would dare to limit women's intellectual spheres. She wrote, one can perfectly well philosophize while cooking supper. Let's have a little more music. This is another Christmas text by Sor Juana, this time set to music by another Bolivian composer, Manuel de Mesa y Carizo, who was master of music at the Cathedral in La Plata, Bolivia, now called Sucre. This clever and witty text was written to celebrate the birthday of the Virgin Mary, and it tells of a, an allegorical argument between stars and flowers over who's more beautiful and how their beauty is reflected in the Virgin Mary's attributes. Now this was of course the age before intellectual property lawsuits and YouTube copyright bots, so nobody complained when Sor Juana's text was modified from its original version and recast not for the birthday of Mary, but the birthday of Jesus, praising the newborn baby instead of his mother. I guess some guys just need to hog the spotlight. Again, we will hear sopranos Tess Altaveros and Danielle Sampson with Stephen Stubbs and Pacific Music Works from our 2019 Navidad concert at Nordstrom Recital Hall at Benaroya Hall in Seattle. <laughs>
1694, and we don't really have all the details about exactly how this came to be, but by 1694, a combination of ecclesiastical and personal pressure weighed heavily enough on Sor Juana to cause her to sell her entire library and her scientific instruments and her collections uh, and donate the money to charity. At that point, she devoted herself completely to helping the poor and stopped writing. In the next year, the plague hit Mexico City. She contracted the, the disease herself while caring for her stricken sisters and died on April 17, 1695 at the age of 46. While her poetry continued to be read and appreciated and set to music throughout the 18th century, it was only toward the end of the 20th century that her true importance as a proto-feminist writer who was unafraid to challenge the misogyny and patriarchal hierarchies in both the sacred and secular spheres gained wider acceptance. Since then, she's entered both the popular and the academic spheres, both in the New World and the Old. She's appeared on currency and postage stamps. And in academic circles, her writings are being further and further established as part of the feminist canon. And they're, they're wonderful. I encourage you to seek them out as well, because this is a woman who is absolutely unafraid to challenge colonialism and patriarchy and the status quo. Thank you for listening to this first installment in our virtual underground series. There will be more, and we need your help to make that happen. Uh, there's a donate link right there. If you click on it, that will send you to a web page that will help you support these further efforts. Uh, we're going to have a few more programs coming up uh, where we dig into our archives and find some of the best performances from Pacific Music Works history and build programs around that, but we're also in the works to create new content for you, our fans. And we look very much forward to the day when we can gather again in person and continue to expand the world of great music and bring it to new audiences in fun places with maybe a little bit of this at the same time. From all of us at Pacific Music Works, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time, and thank you for your generosity. Take care.